And let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word for us tonight. And as we turn our attention to the prophet Zechariah, uh, we pray that uh, as this message was to your ancient people, yet it is still a word for us today, that we may listen with fresh ears uh, today to what the Spirit says to us. So open our hearts, open our minds, uh, open our lives to your word, that as much as we read it, it may read us more and may teach us how to follow in the way of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, so this evening we are beginning, uh, Zechariah will be uh, covering uh, what is largely considered the introductory uh, paragraph of Zechariah, which is chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Uh, this will give way to a longer section of Zechariah that begins in verse 7, that stretches all the way into chapter 6. Uh, and that will be a series of visions that Zechariah has uh, over probably over a, uh, a number of nights, not all in one single night, although there are those who would argue for that interpretation. Um, but tonight we are dealing with something um, not as perplexing as some of the visions that Zechariah will see in this first set of visions. And then there's another set of visions that will come later, which um, are even more perplexing for my, <laughs> in my opinion. Um, but tonight we are uh, going to be covering uh, a lot of the things um, that, that will help set the stage for what comes later, establish who Zechariah is, uh, what is the general thrust of his message uh, to the people, uh, and why God is going to speak to his people specifically through two prophets uh, who are contemporaries of each other. So let's jump into the text, and we're going to do so by looking at verse 1. Of chapter one. It says, In the eighth month, in the second year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edu, saying. Now, right away, we have a, a very formal introduction uh, for, for this prophet. Uh, he is identified uh, with uh, three layers of his genealogy his own name, uh, his father's name, Berechiah, and his grandfather's name, uh, which is Edu. Now, when we turn our attention uh, to the book of Ezra, uh, also contemporary uh, with uh, Haggai and Zechariah, uh, we meet the prophets in uh, Ezra chapter 5. And there we find out that the prophets, Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edu, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of God of Israel, who was over them. All right, then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatiel, and Jeshua, the son of jo Josedak, arose and began to rebuild the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Prophets of gods were with them, supporting them. Right. So Ezra describes uh, the ministry of Ezra, uh, and uh, or <laughs> it describes the ministry of Ezra. It describes the ministry of Haggai and, and Zechariah as particularly focused on the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, and while that is undeniable in the written text we have of the prophet Haggai, uh, Zechariah is oft also uh, focused, uh, at least in his early um, visions, on that same text. Right. This idea that the time has come to rebuild uh, the temple. And so it shouldn't surprise us uh, that Zechariah is, uh, begins his ministry in the same time that Haggai's uh, recorded prophecies are begun. Now, it is also fairly clear that Zechariah's ministry, um, at least from what we have recorded, lasts longer than the, than the ministry of Haggai, his prophetic ministry. Um, now, there's a number of ways of, of explaining that, but probably... Uh, the primary, early, the primary way we want to understand that uh, is that Zechariah, given that he is a sort of third generation, uh, is likely younger than Haggai. They may have a relationship, um, but it also is why Haggai uh, in Ezra is listed first because he would have been older. He probably would have had a more established prophetic ministry, uh, and therefore would have been given the position of prestige. However, in Ezra, as you can see on the screen before you, uh, Zechariah uh, is identified uh, with Edu, right? And Edu um, is listed uh, earlier uh, in Ezra as one of the early returners uh, from Babylon. Now, just historically speaking, and we don't always get this clear picture of this from the Bible itself, but historically speaking, most of the Jews who had gone off into Babylon, who had established roots in Babylon, even after the Persians take over the empire, right, they choose to stay there. 
right? In fact, throughout this period, most of the greatest Jewish thought is being done not in Jerusalem, but in Babylon, right? The Talmud, as we come to know it, which is sort of a collection of interpretations and, and, and stories that are meant to help understand and flesh out the word of God uh, for Jews, uh, is uh, the, the the lion's share of it is the Babel that still used today is the Babylonian Talmud, right? It's this it's this collection of ideas and stories and sayings that are developed by Jews who are living in exile in Babylon, and even after the exile has been officially lifted and the uh, right of return has been granted uh, to the Jews to go back to their ancestral homeland, um, many of them choose to stay behind. But one, um, among those who come back are especially the priests right, in the priesthood class. And Edu seems to be among that priesthood class. Right Now, this isn't unusual for a prophet to emerge uh, from the pre priests, uh, right? And, and the reason for that is, remember, one of the jobs of the priests uh, is to teach the word of God. Right? And so those familiar with the word of God would also have been those probably most likely to hear from the Lord uh, and to continue to proclaim his word. Right, There would have been consistency in their understanding of the word and then what they are proclaiming uh, to the people. But they also would have been given an advantage in understanding the symbolic world uh, that the Lord is exposing them to in a series of visions uh, and oracles. But... Right, that Ezra identifies Zechariah the son of Edu, and then when we turn our attention back to Zechariah, uh, we run into what some people consider a contradiction in the text. Right, so here we're told that the prophet Zechariah is the son of Berechiah, and who is the son of Edu. Now, this is a common genealogy thing, right? You say the name, and then who who uh, that they are the son of this person, the son of this person, the son of this person, or you can go the other way. So and so. Or did we so and so sired or fathered this person who sired and or fought, you know this person who sired this person who sired this right that's a common genealogy trope uh, throughout uh, the Bible right and so as we get to the earlier chapters like uh, earlier books like in Genesis right we're going the other way from father to son but then later when we get into this post-exilic period because we are trying to establish our roots with what came before right we're trying to get things back up and running in the worship of Yahweh, uh, then the genealogies reverse, right? And so we're getting um, the, the person and then we are tracing back their line. Uh, something similar uh, happens um, uh, in, in Matthew and Luke, right, where we get those genealogies, but but they are going back to that old style of Genesis where they're, where they're starting uh, in Matthew, when they're starting with the old uh, and moving to uh, the new. But then Luke, when he's uh, giving his genealogy, he, he goes back to the new style, right, where uh, he starts with the new and then traces his way down um, to the old, right? And so we see both of those uh, taking their part um, in in the Gospels, right? But different Gospels uh, and used in very different ways. So critics of the Bible, those who don't like the Bible, would look at this uh, and they would say, well, you know, Ezra, you know, made a mistake. And so therefore there's a mistake in the Bible, or they would say that there's a contradiction in the Bible. Um, but Matthew's genealogy of Jesus, or really of Joseph, uh, is, is a perfect example of what often happens, right? Where, um, you know, either we, we have uh, somebody who has died young and in essence is adopted into the home of his grand of his paternal grandfather, which would have been very common to do, uh, or somebody has, uh, uh, there's been some Leverite marriage, right? And so things kind of get moved around, right? You get odd things uh, in genealogies, um, or somebody is just a scandalous, right? Or a scoundrel. And, and so, you know, we just try to erase their memory. Um, what also is is a possibility, perhaps, um, and I had thought to say that, you know, it's it's the likely reason uh, is Edu is, is a known figure, right? And so Ezra's like, oh, yes, well, uh, is, is that, and in fact, he's such an important and known figure uh, that Ezra makes sure to connect Zechariah to that. Notice Haggai uh, in the Ezra text uh, is given no genealogy himself. But Zechariah is, and largely to connect him with the priestly caste, right, with those who, who serve uh, in, in what will be, once again, the temple. But there's another thing that's, that's likely to happen, and it's probably for one of two reasons. 
right? Uh, and that is uh, that Zechariah has accompanied Edu on his return, uh, and Berechiah is either stayed, his father has either stayed behind in Babylon, possible, or more likely has died. Right. And because of that, right, and because Zechariah would have been uh, returned uh, with his grandfather, but because there's that paternalistic relationship uh, between them in that return, uh, then Ezra identifies Zechariah more closely with Edu, although Zechariah in his own book wants to be very clear that his father is Berechiah, uh, who is the son of Edu, Edu being his grandfather. Um, for whatever reason, you know, Ezra uh, leaves out Berechiah, maybe he's not of importance. Maybe he did return, um, but, you know, isn't serving as a priest, or maybe he stayed behind or for whatever, or maybe he's dead, right? For whatever reason, he just leaves him out. But since this is Zechariah's book, and he's telling his own story, he wants to be sure that his father uh, is listed there so that they can understand, right, that he is the grandson of Edu, uh, the priest, and not his son. Hebrew also doesn't have a very good word to talk about grandfathers and grandsons. All right, this is the way it usually does it, um, where you have to just list everybody. But it would have been common uh, at the time to be able to list several generations uh, of your family, like tracing way, way back. Um, I heard a scholar once say about Joseph um, when he was uh, in Bethlehem, you know, not with a nine-month-old Mary who's going to give birth any second, but with a pregnant wife, right? And they're going around not to traveling places called inns. That's not the word that Luke uses. Luke actually uses the word upper room, what we might understand today as guest room. They're going around to, in the city of Bethlehem, the city of David. Luke they're going around. Oh, there we go. Oh, we unmuted. <laughs> I think we got it there. Uh, there go. Nope, we sure didn't. Just one second here. Let me fix that. No, I think we got it. Anyway, so while they're going around, what they're doing, actually, it's going around to various um, very distant relatives, right? And they're appearing at their doors, right? And they're kind of walking their way back down the line, right? And so the idea there is you would knock on somebody's door, right? And then that person would come to the door, right? And they and they would say, you know, why should I let you stay in my guest room? And then you start reciting your genealogy, right? And as soon as you get to a common ancestor, then you go, oh, okay. Um, but especially in Joseph's case, when he gets to David, right? For the sake of David, most people would let you stay uh, um, in their home. So the amazing thing and probably the saddest thing about all of this um, is that while they may have been taken in by a family because of the overcrowding due to the census, um, they are not given a guest room, which would have been customary, especially for a woman about to give birth. But because she needs um, uh, because they don't have that guest room, they're made to stay down right in sort of the lower level of, of the typical peasant's home. So there were kind of a platform over um, that lower uh, level. And then on top of that, most houses would have had a guest room built sort of on the roof section. But, you know, think of a raised platform and underneath that, that's the, um, when Jesus says to go into your closet and lock the door, that's where the closet would be. In fact, it's probably the only door you have uh, with a lock on it. Uh, and then there would have been an open area kind of down and in front of that, the main family dwelling area would have been above that locked room. And that's where the animals were kept at night. And so um, you can find all sorts of archaeological evidence of these homes where uh, mangers are cut into the floors or they're hung on, on the sides of the walls, or especially on that back platform area. And the animals would have been kept there at night, one, to, to keep them secure, but uh, two, also to keep the family warm. The, the warmth of the animals would warm the home uh, in the evening. And so that's where uh, Mary gives birth, is down there. Uh, it may also have been that she's just staying down there. Not, so I know this messes with everybody's Christmas, and I promise not to bring it up again uh, until Christmas time. But, you know, the, the idea that they're, you know, that there's a mean innkeeper who says, no, there's no place for you to stay, but I got this bar and you can go sleep in the barn. That's just not how the ancient world worked. Um, it's a very Western idea of how things work, uh, and certainly, but, you know, you're removed several hundred years before that would have been a common thing for people, uh, especially for peasants. Um, and so, that being said, being able to recite one's genealogy uh, can give you uh, real benefits, right, real benefits uh, in, in, in the world, but it also connects you with something that's important. 
And what this connects Zechariah to uh, is the priests. Remember, priests have those three main functions, right? They proclaim the word of God, right? They teach the word of God to the people. Uh, they offer sacrifice on behalf of the people and they pray for the people, right? Those are those three main functions, right? And we can still see those um, in what today we would call the ordinary means of grace, right? We still think that these are the three things uh, primarily that churches should be doing, uh, especially in our uh, divine worship, right? We should be proclaiming the word of God. We should be praying uh, and we should be offering not sacrifices, but sacraments uh, for the people, right? In fact, those three things are the ways that the Holy Spirit communicates the grace of Jesus Christ to you. But connecting Zechariah into the priestly line of Edu tells you that Zechariah grew up in a home uh, in which the word of God would have been known and taught, right? Which makes him uniquely qualified in order to receive these very visions of the Lord, but also to make pronouncements on behalf of the Lord, which is what he's going to do uh, in our passage today. So we'll begin uh, by reading verses two through three, right? You might think of this as sort of uh, his introduction um, to what is going on here. Uh, and in verses two and three, we read this. The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. All right. So we've met um, language like this uh, before. Uh, in the book uh, of Amos, right? And we saw this um uh, earlier, right? This is that idea. It's a Hebrew word, shuv, right? It's it's the basically the word for repent, right? And so we're going to read through Amos. This is Amos chapter four, beginning in verse six, right? And we'll just read through a few of these, right? These are, at least in my world, these are famous, right? This important section of Amos. Of course, as, as most of you know, I did a lot of undergraduate work in the book of Amos. Not undergraduate work, but seminary work in the book of Amos. So things that I think are famous and not everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> Take that with a grain of salt. Anyway, so verse six, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you did not return to me. In other words, uh, declares the Lord. In other words, the Lord said famine, cleanness of teeth, right? When you don't eat anything, your teeth get really white and really clean because there's nothing to stain them with. It says, I also withheld a rain from you uh, when there were yet three months to the harvest. I will send rain on one city and send no rain on another city. One field will have rain and the field on which it did not rain would wither. So two or three cities would water to another city to drink water, and they would not be satisfied. In other words, you know, if you're having to combine cities, there's not enough water for anybody to go around. And then the refrain, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Just one more of these. I struck you, we, we saw this in Haggai. I struck you with blight and mildew, your mini gardens and your vineyards, your fig trees and your olive trees, the locusts devoured, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. Um. It goes on and on. You can see uh, some of these until finally we get to verse 12. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. That is not a promise. That is a threat. Right. And so the idea that God says, well, because you did not return to me, prepare to meet your God. Right. Not in mercy, but in wrath. Right. In wrath. Um, we need to look at. Well, let's do this. Uh, so this is uh, Jeremiah. Uh, this really, it's coming forward here, but it's these same ideas, right? So Jeremiah chapter uh, 25, verses four through five, you have neither listened nor inclined your ears to me, although the Lord persistently sent to you all his servants, the prophets saying, turn now every one of you from his evil way and evil deeds and dwell upon the land the Lord has given to you and your fathers of old forever. Do not go after other gods to serve and worship them or provoke me to anger with the work of your hands. Then I will do you no harm, yet you have not listened to me, declares the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own harm. In other words, God is saying, look, I'm giving you a warning. Don't do these things, right? Because if you do these things, it, I will not turn to you with mercy and grace, right? And, and I will turn to you instead uh, with wrath, with wrath. Um, and you do not want my wrath to fall on you. Now, you may look at these prophets, you may say, oh, my goodness, you know, how are the people to know this stuff was coming? Well, remember, way back in Deuteronomy 28, right, the covenant, right? So at the end of Moses' life, the, Moses is recapitulating all of his teachings over the years. So one way to look at, at Deuteronomy, right, Deuteronomy is set much later than the other books 
right, much later than Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, although Numbers spans quite a bit of time. But Deuteronomy is set at the end of Moses' 40 years of ministry, right? Exodus and Leviticus uh, and Numbers are set, right, sort of in that initial period of coming out, although Numbers spans uh, a longer period of time. But Deuteronomy is somewhat distant from even the end of Numbers, right? So now, it's been sometimes Moses is reaching the end of his life. He knows because of uh, his disobedience to the Lord um, that he will not be entering into uh, the land that God had promised. Uh, and as a result of that, Moses has to prepare the people uh, to go on without him. It's actually something good leaders do. All right. So if you just want to take general leadership lessons uh, from the scriptures, good leaders must prepare their organizations, their people to go on without them. Right. To to go on to the next leader. Right. Like unhealthy. So I'm a pastor. Right. So I think about pastoral ministry a lot. Right. And especially in my time serving on various committees of the presbytery, especially ministerial committees. Right. We have seen uh, times in which um, they're very unhealthy transitions. Right? And those unhealthy transitions uh, largely take one form, and that is that the pastor does not um, leave the congregation in a place where they are ready to accept new leadership. Right, And so you can think of this like the congregation is still carrying a torch for their old pastor. Now, maybe their old pastor left because he retired, and those um, can be very joyful times. Uh, for the church and for uh, the minister, right, where he goes riding off into the sunset and the church thanks him for his service uh, and then takes some time and prepares themselves for the next pastor. That's what you all did. Um, but more often you get a, sort of this idea. It's like, well, I'm going to leave, but I'm not really going to leave. I'm just going to go and hang out for a little while somewhere else. Uh, and then as soon as I feel like it, I'm just going to come back. Right. And that's actually a lot of churches end up doing that. Even churches are presbytery. I, I don't find it particularly healthy um, for those churches, right? Because good leaders prepare their organizations to move on uh, to the next leader. And that's what Moses does. Moses prepares the people to come under the leadership of Joshua. Right? But he does so by reminding them of the various things that he has received from the Lord and handed on to them, right? He reminds them of the story in the early chapters of Deuteronomy, the story that has brought them to this place. Uh, and then he sort of gives uh, the Ten Commandments, right, quite famously. Then most of what follows in Deuteronomy, until you get to the concluding chapters of Deuteronomy, is a commentary on the Ten Commandments. Right? There's lots of ways that people are like, oh, no, it's like he's just given various laws and this and that and the other thing. It's like, no, if you really read Deuteronomy and understand it, right, beginning right after those commandments are given, right, beginning in chapter 6 and following, what you have is a long commentary on each of the commandments in order. Sometimes there's a lot to be said about those commandments, right? Like, for instance, you shall have no other gods before me, the first commandment. Sometimes there's not so much to be said about those commandments, like the expansion of um, thou shalt not steal. There's not much to be said there because you just don't do those things, right? But, you know, when he's discussing, you know, honor your father and mother, that's where we get the idea that there's this general consensus that that, that commandment is certainly about your parents, but it's also about those in legitimate authority over you, right? Or when we get to adultery, right? It, it's not just that we're talking about, you know, um, stepping out on your spouse. It's It's general sexual morality that's being implied there. So at the end of that, sort of section, right? Because this is a covenant, right? The covenant begins with, this is what God has done to establish himself as, as your God. These are his commands. This is how you shall live as his people. And this is how we continue to think about and apply those commands to various situations uh, in our lives. Right? We get to the end of this. And in chapter 28, what is presented to the people, right, is blessings for obedience, right? Verses 1 through 14, blessings for the obedience of the people. But beginning in verse 15, we get curses for disobedience. And we're not going to read this whole section. It's very long, very detailed. We're just going to read uh, basically the first paragraph because right? it, it will give you, similar to what we just did in Amos, it, it will give you enough of a feeling for the text uh, that you understand everything that follows it. 
So verse 15, but if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall be you in the city. Cursed shall be you in the field. Cursed shall be you, your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in. Cursed shall you be when you go out. Right, so here's the idea. You as a people, not you as an individual, right? All the yous here, right, are plural, right? You as a people will be cursed. In other words, you will not have God's favor, but instead you will be recipients of God's wrath, right? And so God goes into great detail with the people, right, of all of the various ways, right? So you can think of this, it's very similar to the way Deuteronomy itself works, right? You can go down each of these curses, dot, 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 and then as you follow down underneath, you'll see commentary basically on the general curses of verse uh, 16 uh, through 19, right? It, but it goes on. I'm just trying to scroll for you to give you a feel for it. It just goes on and on and on and on and on and on, right? Until finally we get down to verse 6, 8, right? It says, and the Lord will bring you back in ships to, to Egypt, a journey that I promised that you should never make again. And there you shall offer yourselves for sale to your enemies as male and female slaves, but there will be no buyer, right? So in the end, right? And this is, by the way, um, a beautiful passage. Right? I, I love the Bible. I think you all know that much. It's just, it's just set aside, you know, it's God's word. It just beautiful the way all of these literature points connect right and so the idea here that god is saying finally at the end is not you're going to go back to egypt and you're going to try to sell yourself to egypt what he's talking about ultimately uh, is what israel actually does right and so in the end israel is trying to find safety right from the babylonians and and in order to do that they're going to try to make an alliance with egypt Right. In other words, they're going to try to come under, instead of paying protection money to Babylon, they're going to try to come under the protectorate of Egypt, right? And so pay them, hopefully, I'm going to guess a discounted price, uh, to come under their protectorate. And Egypt won't do it, right? And that's why they fall to the Babylonians, right? Because Egypt ultimately does not come to their aid. They have warned again and again and again and again by the prophets, don't make an alliance with Egypt. Egypt won't help you when you need them to help you. Right? They won't help you when you need them to help you. Anyways, sorry. So completely aside. Right? So what happens? Well, the people listen to all of this. They listen to the blessings. They listen to the curses. Right? And remember, this is a new generation. Right? This is the wilderness generation. This is a generation that has grown up outside of Egypt. This is the generation that is prepared to go into Canaan and carry out God's will by destroying the evil Canaanite culture. And especially the most abhorrent of all practices, child sacrifice. This is the group that is prone to do that, right? And so what do they do after they've listened, right? And you can think of these as a number of sermons, right? Could you imagine sitting through all of Deuteronomy 1 through 28, right? In one sitting, probably not. This is probably preaching that Moses is doing over a series of days, right? Over a series of days, right? Perhaps, you know, he's he's given the story one day with the Ten Commandments, and then the next day he's giving all of his commentary on the First Commandment, and then all of his commentary on the Second Commandment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so we get to the end of that. Right. And so now all, you know, over a series of a week, maybe two weeks, who knows? Moses is then going to sit down and say, OK, these are the blessings for obedience. These are the curses. Are you going to continue in this covenant relationship with God? Right. And the people of God, Israel, sits down and says, OK, we we sign on. We are endorsing this covenant, those promises that he made to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, those promises that he made to our fathers and our mothers uh, through you, Moses, to bring you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, those promises, right, that he has made to us to be our God and for us to be his people, right, the basic terms of the covenant are sure. And we say, yes, we are renewing our covenant Right. We be, we are going to once again say this is our God. This is the God who has saved us. And, and we therefore will live uh, as his people. Right. And so we go through all of this beautiful covenant renewal. Right. And, and we get down to chapter 30. Right. So this covenant, this beautiful covenant renewal has come upon them. 
right? And as we get, sorry, let's go to the end of chapter 29, right? It says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. A little bit earlier, sorry. Let's go up to verse 27. It says, therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land, bringing upon it all the curses written in this book. And the Lord uprooted them from their land in anger and fury and great wrath and cast them into another land as they are this day, right? So in other words, something has happened. They've broken it. They've received the curses and the people have been removed from the land that God has promised them and they have been moved out to another land, right? God's wrath has fallen upon them. They have gone off into exile, right? Nothing that happens later in the Old Testament is confusing. If you go back to Deuteronomy, you understand that God had warned his people about the potential consequences for disobedience, right? And the potential consequence for their disobedience is exile, right? If this covenant, right back up in, in verse 25, right? If this covenant gets abandoned, exile is the expected result, right? It's the expected result, right? If, 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 if the faith of their fathers, right, is abandoned, then they should expect the wrath of God to fall upon them. And we might say, and that's the end, right? That's how it ends, right? So if you read through, right, uh, and we sometimes call it the Deuteronomical history, right? So if we read through the text, right, and we get down to the end of Second Kings, which all of it seems to follow, right, from uh, Judges all the way to Second Kings, seems to follow um, a very similar style of Hebrew, a very similar style of writing, right? And it, it sort of tells one story as so we go from Judges to Joshua to, to the Kingdom's literature, First and Second Samuel, First and in second kings right it ends right and it ends with the expected result of exile right and then there they are in the land and that seems like it's the end but it, it's not the end of the old testament and it's not the end of god's word to you either right because if it's not the way things end right chapter 29 doesn't end right with with this unfortunate you know curse for disobedience it ends with a promise the things even even if there has been this rebellion, even if there has been this covenant breaking, even if there's been this exile, that's not how the story ends. Right? And so God says to his people in, in through Moses in chapter 30, he says, and when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God is driven you, right, exile, and return to the Lord your God. There's that idea again. You and your children and obey his voice and all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. And he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. And it goes on from here. It's a beautiful text, beautiful text. Um, but that's what's going on. Is 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 just as the Lord's wrath has fallen upon his people and he has scattered them. If the people repent. Right. God gathers them back to himself. Right. Because ultimately our God is a God of grace. He's a God of grace. Right. So let's take it all the way back, right? All the way back to Babylon. Right. And, and, and not Babylon in the exile, but I'm talking Babylon in Genesis chapter 11, right? Where here are all of the nations of the world and they, they developed a new technology. Right? It's called the brick. Right. And they decide that with this new technology, that they're going to build a city that rivals God. In fact, they're going to use this new technology and they're going to build a giant tower. Right? And that tower is going to stretch even up into the heavens. Right. And then they're going to mount this tower and they're going to climb to the top and they're going to pronounce themselves to be lords of the universe. God says it, it can't be this way. If I let them continue this way, right, then there's nothing that they can't accomplish. That's what the Hebrew says, right? It's this weird thing. People are like, what is that supposed to mean? Is God just mean? He's jealous of them, blah, blah, blah. No, it means if they do this, in other words, if I allow them to proceed in the direction that they think that they're going forever, then they're going to think themselves gods. And if they think themselves gods, they will never repent and return to me. So instead, what God does is he destroys their ambition by scattering them into languages and people groups and cultures throughout the world. But this promise of gathering his people is not just in the microcosm of Israel. Remember, Israel is always a little story, right? It's always figure. Israel is always standing in for a 
bigger global story that's going on behind that, right? Israel becomes sort of the proto-church. But, but always in view behind that is the bigger picture. How does God return not just this one people to his worship, but all the peoples of the world to his worship? How do we get right to Revelation 7-9? I think I have a different passage to pull up in Revelation here. Yeah, I sure do. But let's go back to Rev 7-9. How do we get here right after okay so it's important we're not teaching revelation now but right we, there's there's a movement in revelation i've told you this lots of times but it, it's worth it right where where the, uh, john will hear something right and what he hears right is this hundred and forty four thousand, right a representative total of all of israel right so he hears who's going to be saved he hears Israel called, right? A roll call for Israel. But then he turns and he looks, right? Remember Revelation, Apocalypse, it means to turn, it means to see, right? To turn and to see, right? And so John, there's this trope that happens throughout Revelation. We're going to get there next year, but just keep this in mind. John hears something, right? A lion, for instance, and then he turns and he looks and he, he sees something, but it's not the thing he, he heard, Right. So he hears a line and he turns and he sees a lamb who looks as though he's been slain. Right. So he hears the roll call of Israel. But when he turns and looks in Revelation 7, 9, he sees something far more wonderful. Right. He says, after this, I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from Every nation from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches in their house and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Right? That's all the nations of the world, representatives of every nation who is crying out that we have but one God. That we have but one Savior, the Lamb, Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? And so we're not scattered anymore right but but we don't go back to something that was before right we don't go back to all speaking one language we don't go back to any of these things no we're representative of our languages right it, it's not for nothing right that he says tongues here right languages here right there's no mistakes about this right because we move forward into something better right so just as the nations of the world have been scattered there is an in-gathering at the end of all things. And so the story that we're meeting here at the beginning of Zechariah right, is a little piece of that. Right? It's saying, look at what has happened in the history of Israel. Look at this little thing that has happened. Right? It's not little to the people. I don't, don't mistake me. But in comparison to this, it's much smaller. Right? God has sent his people off into exile because of their covenant disobedience. And then at just the right time, as Jeremiah has prophesied 70 years later, he has gathered his people back to himself. And so when we step back and we look at that in a much bigger picture, what is God doing with all of humanity? They have been scattered. But in Jesus Christ, he has begun to gather the people back to himself, to bring them home. Right? And just as the return from Babylon to Jerusalem right, happens in waves and in and, 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 and large groups and small groups over time, this ingathering of the nation since the ascension of Christ to reign from the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, with his saints in light, right, has been this gathering of the people with the ultimate idea that they will gather once more, not in a new Jerusalem to rebuild a temple, as we're going to find in Zechariah, but they will gather in a new Jerusalem created by God himself, in which there's no temple. Specific language from Revelation. Because God himself is in the midst of her. You don't need to contain him, because now we can all dwell in his presence. Right? A beautiful text that we read at funerals. See, the dwelling place of God is with man. And he will be their God, and they will be his children. What does this have to do with Zechariah? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
So Zechariah is seen, right, again, in miniature, right? A little example of a great big global story that God is telling. Right? So miniature, he's saying, look, there was a time in which my wrath fell on your fathers. There was a time in which I scattered them to the nations. But always with the promise, return to me says the Lord of hosts, that's his military title, the Lord of the angel armies. Right? Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Right? I'm rallying you to my cry. And if you hear my cry and take up my cause, then I will hear your cry and take up your cause. It's a renewal of covenant. Right? But it, it, it's, it's a symmetry, right? God makes a covenant of grace. He, he, he saves his people. He makes a covenant, right? The people say, yes, we will live as your people, but then the people rebel, right? And they no longer live as God's people, but now the people repent and return and say, we will live as God's people. And God once more renews his covenant with them and says, yes, you will always be mine. Powerful stuff. That's what's going on in the text. Right? So we're in that accordion middle there of, of people actions, right? Faithfulness, rebellion, repentance, right? But it's always bookended by the grace of God. God was gracious to deliver Israel, and God is gracious to forgive them. That's your God. That's the God you worship. That's the God that nobody wants to talk about anymore. I don't know what we think we're going to do without him, but nobody seems to want to talk about him anymore. I don't know where we think we're going to get our big story that's going to define us. I don't know where we're going to get our morality, right? unless it's the absoluteness of this one God. I don't know where any of that is going to come from. And I think that the answers so far that our increasingly secular culture is giving are terrible. Like they're making our young people anxious and depressed and they feel meaningless and hopeless and purposeless, right? There's nothing about them, right? They become nihilistic and self-destructive. They, 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 it's like they're rebuilding the Tower of Babel. And, and they're like, well, we don't need any of those things. We can define, you know, it's like they, they've done the worst of what Nietzsche uh, talked about, right? They, they said, we are, have killed God with our sealing eyes, right? We are now the ones to make our own morality, right? I'm never quite sure. Uh, we, I, I know you're all Nietzsche scholars here. You know, I spent a good year, especially during the, the COVID years when I have a lot of us going on, uh, reading a lot of Nietzsche. And most of us, our, our version of Nietzsche has been edited later by his sister, right? And so we, we don't really have a lot of his original writings. Um, but it's never, I'm never quite sure. I mean, there are people who are much better Nietzsche scholars than I am. But when I'm reading him, right, he keeps talking about the creation of, of, of the Superman, the Supermensch, right, the, uh, the Ubermensch, and, and this idea of, of we are going to define our morality. I'm not sure he thinks that's a good idea. Because ultimately, you, you devolve into um, uh, relativism, but relativism always gives way, right, to totalitarianism. Right? Because somebody will come through and will say, no, I am the one in power and you will all obey what I say. And as a Christian reading Nietzsche, who I think is wrong about a lot of stuff, a, a lot of stuff, most everything, as a Christian who reads Nietzsche, right, you have to step back and you have to say, yeah, and that's what happens when you get rid of God. Right? When you no longer have the abstract absolute, right, who is the concrete God, you have to create your own moral universe and your own rules for living in that moral universe. Uh, and whatever you create is, is, is going to be bad. All right. And so the Christian cry to the culture that surrounds us, that's increasingly secular, increasingly Nietzschean and nihilistic, right, is to say, and, and as you go further down this road, you will realize all along that we were right. That surrendering to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who raised Jesus from the dead, right, and laying down the sin of Adam, where we keep trying to say, I will be the one who decides what's right and wrong. I will be the one who decides good and evil. 
right? laying that down, surrendering that to God. It's an act of worship to do that, but surrendering to that to God is actually freedom. It doesn't feel like freedom because we think and we've confused in our cultural age in which we find ourselves choice with freedom, but nobody wants to be free to choose between good and evil. You want to be free to choose what's good and true and beautiful in this world. Right? And so God gives you a plan in Zechariah. He says, return to me and I will return to you. I hope that's in your prayers. For not just yourself and your own personal faith, although that's important, repentance is a, you know, it's, it's the lifeblood of the Christian. But for your country, in your community, in your neighborhood, in your family. That's our prayer. That's what we want. Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Lay down your rebellion. And come once more into the joy of serving our God. But there's a warning, verse 4. It says, do not be like your fathers. To whom the former prophets cried out, thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Right, That's that Jeremiah passage we read earlier. Right, Look, other prophets came before Zechariah. Zechariah is not saying, <laughs> he's saying quite pointedly, I'm not telling you anything new. I'm not saying anything you haven't heard before. Right, You heard this back in Deuteronomy chapter 30. You heard this in Jeremiah 25. You heard this in Amos chapter 4. You heard this over and over and over and over again from the prophets. You already have heard everything you need to hear. So this isn't new information. It's not something that's novel to you. Right, Jeremiah said, repent. Amos said, repent. Right, the prophets say, repent. So Zechariah is telling the people, don't be like your fathers. Because when your fathers heard, especially Jeremiah, when your fathers heard Amos, even when your fathers heard Moses, they didn't repent. Jesus himself says they won't listen to Moses. What, what makes you think they'll listen to me? Even if I should be raised from the dead. Right? That's that idea there is you already have the word. Right? People think they need something more than the word of God. Word of God is self-contained. It already has everything that you need in it. If, and the mistake we make with the Bible over and over and over again is its primary purpose. Right? Too often, culturally, uh, we're told, and lots of people outside of the church want to tell Christians, you know, this is your primary, your primary mission, right, is to be kind, right? Your primary mission is to, is, is to basically function as a social welfare agency. No, the primary mission of the church is a proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ who died to save sinners like me. And through faith, he can save you too, right? Primary mission of the church is to proclaim that gospel for the salvation of mankind, don't get it twisted. Don't get it confused. That's why the church exists and no other reason. And the problem that we get, though, is, is, is we want the Bible and, right? This is this one of my long-standing pet peeves in the church. Right? I want the Bible and this, and I want the Bible and that, right? I was talking to somebody, um, somebody who I really like, a friend of mine in the press area, and he's like, oh, have you read this book? This? I said, no, I just mostly read the Bible over and over and over and over and over again. I read a lot of the Bible, and I think about the Bible, right? and I meditate, and I consider, and I ponder the scriptures over and over and over and over again. Is that there's other good thinkers and other good folks, and, and, and I've given you a couple, right, uh, of guys to think about with, with the Bible, like Mackay. Um, 
sit with the word, right? And, and let it just pound into you. But, you know, we, we want other solutions, we want other things. I, I, I got <laughs> kind of an infamous uh, reputation on, on the EPC pastor's Facebook page, which is a big deal, by the way. Be like, oh, who cares about that? It's like, no, it's like basically every EPC pastor, right? It's sort of the the, the clearinghouse for conversations uh, throughout the year between EPC pastors. No, you can't join it. You actually have to be a pastor. Um but I got a reputation for a couple of years before I kind of quit using Facebook altogether. Um, and every time somebody would ask for a book recommendation, it's like, oh, I'm looking for a book, you know, to read uh, with my staff about leadership. And I said, the Bible. I'm looking for a curriculum for my youth group. And I said, the Bible, right? It's like over and over and over again. It's like the Bible's enough. You really don't need more than that. It really is a powerful book. Because it tells you who God is. That's its purpose, right? But we confuse it, right? And the culture confuses it because it keeps telling you, no, the Bible's primary purpose is to tell you, um, it's to teach you morality. No, the Bible's primary purpose is to tell you there's a God, you're not him. And how you relate to that God means everything. Okay? It's in light of that that you know who you are. It's in light of that that you learn how to live as God's people. But its primary purpose is to say, this is God. The one and the only. Right. So the message that the church continues to have for the culture around us is the message that Zechariah has for Israel in his time. Return to me and I will return to you. Right, And as Zechariah is pointing out, this isn't new information. Nothing here is new. Right. This is something you've heard over and over and over again. And then he says something that sounds initially quite cryptic. He says, your fathers, where are they? And, and the prophets, do they live forever? He says, but my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants the prophets, do they not overtake your fathers? Right? In other words, human beings, you are limited. You do not live forever. But my word through those prophets does, and it doesn't change. God's message to his people in Deuteronomy, God's message to his people in Amos, God's message to his people in Jeremiah is the same message he is giving to his people through Zechariah, right? It's not different, and it's not different than the message we have in Jesus Christ, right? The difference is that Jesus has come to universalize the particular covenant God has made with Israel. Right? But Jesus tells you, right, what, what, what is the course that is before you, right? Mark one fifteen, right? The time is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. This is it. We've made it. And, and your place is repent, return to the Lord. And put your faith once more in his good news. And so what Zechariah says here, right, is men die. Prophets stop speaking. But God's word doesn't stop. And it's never, ever wrong. So his prophets, right, they overtook them, right? They conquered them, right, with their words, right? My prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? Did they not conquer your fathers? So they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and our deeds, so he has dealt with us. And those who have gone before you have also repented, But more than that, they have said God was right and just in his actions. Right? They're not shaking in angry fists. They're not making a deal with God. Right? They're not making a deal with God that says, okay, all right, we'll repent so we can make you treat us nice again. No, it, it, that's not enough for what's going on here. Right? It's saying that God's wrath was justified, was right to fall on us. But his mercy and grace are so much greater. 
right? part of the act of faith for the Christian, right, is to say my, what Jesus did on the cross, his death on the cross is what my sin deserves. And God would be right to pour out his condemnation on me. Now, there's this old ordination question in the Reformed tradition. It's thrown around on who used to do it, but it was definitely in the Dutch church. And it went something like this. You know, would you be damned for the glory of God? Right? And you listen to that, right? And imagine you're going to be a deacon or a ruling elder, right? Or a pastor like me, right? And, and you're getting up there and right, you're being examined for ministry and they're running through your, your ordination questions and they're trying to help lead you to a place where you understand those, right? And as you're doing that, right, somebody says to you, would you be damned for the glory of God? And you think to yourself, well, but I'm forgiven, right? I have grace. I have all of these things. But the right answer to that question is yes. Right? Because it's a recognition that, that that's what my sin actually deserves. It, I deserve condemnation for my sin. But God's grace is such that that condemnation fell on Jesus and not on me. Right? For both my original corruption and for my actual rebellion, I deserve condemnation. But instead of that condemnation falling on me, it went on Jesus on the cross when Jesus drank the cup of God's wrath down to the dregs. And so part of repentance is recognizing that my sin deserves God's wrath. But by his grace and in his mercy, I am forgiven and made whole. But it, it, it can't end there, right? Repent, that's only half of repentance. The other half of repentance is then denying yourself, taking up your cross by which you will die daily to sin and following in the way of Jesus. It's a turning, right? That metanoia, that's the Greek word here, right? Shuv is the Hebrew word, right? It's, it, it's a turning, a changing of the mind. That's what metanoia means, right? That says, I'm no longer going to live in the way that I did. I will now live in the way that God has put before me. Right? But there's an acceptance to say, but even if I should suffer, it is deservedly so. All glory be to God. So Zechariah has arrived at a time, right, where in November, December of 520 BC, right, that the temple work is getting going, all of these things, right? And he's arrived at a time to tell the people, it is good what you were doing, right? And next week we're going to see, right, that it's a time of, of peace amongst the nations, right? Maybe turmoil within God's people, but peace among the nations, right? And peace with the nations means it's a time to build temples, It's a time to build temples. But he's arrived to tell the people, you may have come back physically from exile, but you need to come back spiritually from exile. Return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this word. It's powerful and meaningful. And we can look at this text and we can read it and say, well, what possibly can this say to us? But it, it, it's not a different message. Jesus Christ called us to repent and believe. This is what Zechariah is telling the people of God. So we want to turn away from our sinful ways and turn to the way of Jesus. Not by our power, but through faith which is the vehicle by which your Holy Spirit communicates grace unto our lives. So may we live in your grace as a transformed people who give you all the glory, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior indeed. Amen.